Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot where the conversations are pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Did you bring your thinking caps? Because it's time to put them on. Because the conversation starts now. Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. We are in Spain today. Oh my God. If you have never been there, Brains, you are missing one of the world's great treasures. And it is holding Tina Sibley. Tina Sibley is such an adventurous woman. Do you know that she has uh, climbed Kilimanjaro more than once? Who does that? She does amazing work through webinars. She works in Africa, supporting individuals there and the culture. I'm so glad to have her here. I want to hear about her story, her journey, and her truth. Trials and tribulations here on The Edge. Let's welcome her. How are you, Tina? I'm very, very well. Thank you, April. It's so good to be here and connect with you. And it it's, is. it's really funny. I love this whole global thing because it's morning for you, but it's evening for me. Oh, my goodness. Well, I wish I was there with you to get some food and have some wine and sit out and watch the people. That was one thing. When we got to Spain, we got there early in the morning. It was a Sunday. We figured it was the Sabbath, you know, people going to church and you know, they weren't doing it, but I tell you by one o'clock, you would think that it was a carnival or a festival. There were people everywhere. How did you end up living in Spain? Well, it was uh, some friends of mine, um, a, a, a good friend of mine that I used to hang out with regularly when I lived in England. So I'm from England and I lived in the Southwest in Plymouth. And a good friend of mine, his job brought him over to Gibraltar because Gibraltar is part of the UK. It's a, a UK overseas territory. And he initially came over here for a six month contract and never returned. So I came out to visit and fell in love with the whole sunshine uh, lifestyle. And originally I wanted to move to Gibraltar. But then once I started coming across the border into Spain and seeing the space and the beaches and the hiking and everything else and the people and the food, I kind of changed my mind and said, like, yeah, that's where I want to live. So I made it happen. So you're very adventurous. Tell us a little bit about your story, your journey and your truth. Well, my journey is that I began life in the corporate world. I was a financial advisor, absolutely hated it. <laughs> I left and then I, I went into training and development. So then I was a corporate trainer for a while doing leadership, communication skills, presentation skills, all of that kind of thing. And then I decided I didn't like the corporate world anymore so I became freelance and I started my own uh, business back in 2000 uh, January 2000 and then um, I kind of got more and more into the coaching side of things so I developed a pass passion for really helping people so I became really fully trained in coaching uh, neuro-linguistic programming and I just found that I just loved helping people and working with people and then uh, you know after my marriage failed I ended up uh, my husband left me for somebody else and then I ended up he left me in a lot of debt uh, that's a whole other story he's not a nice he's not a nice boy now is he <laughs> <laughs> no not at all but you know what but Fortunately, because of my background in coaching and all the rest of it, I had some good tools to help pick myself up. I had a good support network. And so I just started rebuilding my life. And part of rebuilding my life meant that I wanted to come and follow my dream to live in the sunshine and go traveling more. So about five years ago, I started traveling. I began, I did a four and a half month tour of Canada. And then I spent two months in Texas. Y'all, <laughs> y'all, <laughs> no. 
Uh, and I spent about six months back in the UK touring uh, around seeing various family. And then I came back to Spain four and a half years ago. And that was when I decided that, you know what, I, I wanted to start hiking and going up in the mountains. And I put a lot of weight on. So I went on a journey to lose weight and get fit. I'd always been told, oh, you're no good at that. You know, I, I've always been an adventurer at heart. And basically, when I was a kid, I had it smacked out of me. <laughs> you know what it's like conforming, get your right. head out in the clouds and your feet firmly on the ground, all that kind of thing. And I discovered that there was this unfulfilled adventurer in me. And that was when I decided I'm going to hike the Inca Trail uh, in Peru to Machu Picchu. So I started overcoming a huge fear of heights. Uh, I got off the couch and stopped. Uh, dial, dial, dial back a minute. How do you prepare for a adventure like that? Step by step, literally step by step. And this is one of the things which I am a believer in because there's a lot of people out there and coaches who kind of say you have to go from like naught to 10 in one fell swoop. No, you don't. I didn't, you know. Uh, you go from naught to one, one to two, two to three. Sometimes you can take a couple of leaps, but it, it's a journey. The, uh, my, my overcoming my fear of heights, I tried the zero to 10 method and it didn't work. In fact, it sent me backwards. Uh, so when I, when I did it gently, uh, there's, there's there's like your comfort zone, there's your growth zone, but there's also a panic zone, which is not healthy, you know, and nobody wants to be there. And that's actually unhelpful. So it's about, and for some people, they respond to the kind of hypnotherapies that can take you from zero to 10. But in my experience, that's actually quite rare. Mm. And it turns a lot of people off. They don't even want to do it, but they'll go from naught to one. And then they'll feel, I've made progress. And that gives them confidence and courage to take the next step and the next step. Um, and I just literally started walking up the hill. <laughs> Locally, wow. where I live, I'm on a hill. I walked up the hill and then back. And then I went up the hill a bit faster and then back. And then I went a bit further. And then I went on a longer, flatter hike. And then I went on a longer hike with a couple of more hills. And but that's the I physical. That's the that's the physical endurance. The altitude yes. change. It makes you lightheaded. Uh, it people say that when you do these type of adventures, that it is a whole metamorphosis of change. That you overcome again your fears. Uh, that you find new ambitions and new goals. What did you find out about yourself once you came down? It was, uh, well, first of all, I did it because suddenly I had a reason. I had a reason. A lot of times we don't do stuff and then we can build, beat ourselves up because we call ourselves lazy or whatever. And that's not the case. A lot of the time it's simply fear gets in the way. Right. Lack of motivation gets in the way. It's like a lot of people, for example, are setting goals that are not their goals. It's expectations being put on them by other people. Okay. Once you're aligned with who you are and your goals are in alignment with who you are, all of a sudden you come to life. And, that, and that's what happened to me. When I decided, you know what, all my life I've wanted, I, I always had a kind of calling to South America. I used to be connected with any programs on TV about the Aztecs, the Incas, the Mayans. And I had this idea that I would love to hike the Inca Trail because, oh my God, it was built by the Incas, you know, and it was ancient and I have always loved mountains. I went to Austria uh, in the Alps when I was 15 and fell in love with the mountains. But I had that kind of adventurous spirit knocked out of me, but it was always there. And when I when I peeled back the layers and, and did the work and discovered who I really was, and then this resurfaced 
I want to do the Inca Trail, and why the hell not? I've had all these people telling me all my life, I'm no good at doing anything physical. I'm not sporty. I can't keep up. I can't do this. You can't do that. You'll never hack it. And I found that I could. And I joined a hiking group when I first came to Spain. And sure enough, I went out hiking with them and I couldn't keep up. I was comparing <laughs> myself. I was, but I was comparing myself with the wrong people. I was right. Comparing... And you can't compare yourself. That's like working out. I tell people, you know, I see the cute girl. She's killing herself on the elliptical. I yeah. mean, she got the shoulder yeah. on too, and I'm just doing an easy pace. You know, you have to get there. And it's not always won by the swift, but by the one who endureth. Right, Tina? Absolutely. And I nearly gave up hiking because of that experience where I compared myself as a total beginner, overweight and unfit, with people who've been hiking for years you know it's crazy that's not gonna work exactly. but then I, when i started doing it by myself and i found the love of being out in nature and then when i did the inca trail that changed my life april wow. um, because i was it was on day three now day two of the inca trail is the hardest you go up to four thousand two hundred meters which is about I'm not sure what that is in feet, maybe 13,000 feet, something like that. Wow. And uh, on day three, I'd already done the hardest bit. So I knew I was going to succeed and, and get all the way. And we were given the opportunity to go off the trail and have some alone time up in the mountains. And I'm sitting there on this rock. All I can see is peak after peak after peak. And I connected, I did some of my own coaching exercises on myself and visualizations on myself. And I connected with the achievement of how far I'd come so far and that wow. I knew I was going to make it. And just the magic of the place that I was at where I seemed like I was on top of the world. And as I was sat there, a huge black bird flew across my my sight and I found out later it was a condor and I'm not kidding the hackles I, I got goosebumps and I was I want people to experience this I felt unstoppable I felt significant and insignificant all at the same time wow. and I just went all the time all my life people have told me I wouldn't be capable of doing this and here I am and I want to share that with other people. You can do whatever you want. I mean, within reason, I'm never going to be a prima ballerina or a jump jockey because I don't have that build. But there was nothing stopping me from having the adventures that I'd always craved. And, and when I came back, I, I decided I, I want to do. And the other thing I, I noticed was doing those exercises out in nature and especially up in the hills, was a thousand more times powerful than doing it in an environment which is a meeting room or over Zoom. Because there's something about taking yourself out of your normal environment that makes these more powerful. It and does. when you go out into nature, you're connecting with Pachamama, Mother Earth, you know, small incremental steps you know i feel uh i feel for the person that really has severe anxiety polar complete polar opposite to what you're doing they are afraid to step outside their their house but it's yeah. one step at a time it's taking in a new breath uh i know i did that yesterday i said you know what i'm going to intentionally park at the far end of the parking lot so that I have to walk, so that I have to carry the bags, that I have to get the physical exercise in, you know, and everything is a conscious choice. What you eat, who you hang around, your thoughts. Neuro-linguistic programming is very, very powerful because it changes you at a cell level, at a nuclear level. It's not just the conversation that you're having, but it's really a mind shift. But it's the conversation that you are having with yourself. What are you saying? That negative self-talk, that self-doubt, that uh, oh. outside influencing, you know, that echo chamber of negativity that you just constantly 
are, you know, stuck in. So yeah. what would you say to a person right now that's stuck? Pardon? What would you say to a person that is stuck right now? Okay, so a person who is stuck right now, what I normally do is I just get them to tell me about that. And I start looking at the language that they're using. And generally, if anybody is stuck, it comes from fear. It comes from confusion. And generally, that's because they are not in alignment with who they are. Generally, it's because um, of past experiences and the input. So, And sometimes these past experiences are not even direct. We can be we can be sitting on the floor when we're children, minding our own business, and we overhear the adults talking. And generally, they'll be talking about somebody different. It's not even directed at you, but you hear them saying stuff like, who the heck do they think they are? Right. We take all of that on board. And then we think that if we uh, have the audacity to do something different, we we're going to be judged and people are going to say, who the heck does she think she is? You know, that kind of thing. And that's often where we get stuck and we get confused. So I kind of start, basically what I want to do is find out, well, you know, what is it that's telling you you can't do this, that you can't move forward? And so, And it's usually fear and confusion around who they are, what they want, because they've been programmed and they and the other thing is it's confusion comes because there are so many different people let me give you an example years ago if i had an idea if i was faced with a decision i might speak to my friends about it and i would speak to maybe four or five of my friends and here's the problem they would all say something different. So I would then go round and round in circles, not knowing because this person saying this, this person saying that, that person is saying something else. There's only one person that you need to listen to and that's you. But if you don't know who you are, you don't, you know, you, you don't know what that voice is. So I help people to work out who they are. Now, I had a situation where an opportunity came up in the summer for me to just get on a plane and go and visit somebody. I did not ask my friend's permission. I didn't ask what they thought. I booked the flight and I told them, this is what I'm doing. Yeah, you might think I'm crazy. You might think I'm out of my mind. I don't care. This is right for me and I'm going to do it. That's the power of being in alignment with who you are. And then suddenly you get clarity um sure there's i go to business advisors for advice on business you know that type of thing but when it comes to the fundamentals this is this is who i listen to that little voice that's coming from my heart um because you are because you call it intuition you are the director but also the observer of life now, you've been yeah. able to go on these amazing adventures and look at life from a helicopter view mm -hmm. and reassess yourself, you know? <clears throat> and so I think that's very powerful. What do people have to look forward to when they coach with you in your coaching program? The thing that I find that people are looking for is they want to make some kind of change. Mm -hmm. And they're stuck because they don't know what they need to do or if they do know what they need to to do they uh, are afraid so what i do is kind of just talk to them about you know where they're at and and then it's all about finding courage to take those steps so it could be for example that somebody is in you know that toxic relationship or toxic wow. job and wow. they want to make a change it could be that they need to make some changes around their health or their lifestyle uh, but we always default to what's familiar. Right. And, and, and so I help people to look at 
And it's so important that they find something that's going to work for them because the stuff that works for other people is not necessarily going to work for them. Like, for example, I always knew that I should eat more healthy. And it wasn't until I had a, a, a scare just not that long ago. And I went to um, a natural health doctor and it was, okay, you need to detox urgently. And it was, I, and okay, this is somebody who loves chocolate. <laughs> this is oh. somebody who absolutely loves the sugary stuff, uh, the biscuits, the cake. Um, I mean, and I you, live in, no you, live in a, you live in Spain full of de uh, delicacies. Yeah. And I'm like told no sugar, no alcohol, no bread, no gluten, no, no dairy, no this, no that, the other. And I'm like, well, what's left? You know? Yeah, right. But I, I couldn't just eat salads. That would never work for me. So I found ways of eating what I like. So for example, ice cream is a, I love ice cream. So I found a way of making ice cream, which was sugar free um and and dairy free and i loved it and i'm like whoa who knew uh, i i discovered hazelnut milk for my coffee and now that i've been told by the doctor you know what you don't need to be so strict so you can go back to what you like in moderation i'm like well i'm not going back to normal milk because the hazelnut milk is nicer so right. it's about finding something that's going to work and not just trying to force yourself into a hole or a regime that other people are doing because it works for them. You've got to find what works for you. And, um, and I found a way that. of eating vegetables that I didn't like by putting them in soups and curries. Mm -hmm. So you put a plate you also have to... And I'm like, Right. You also have to change your circle of influence. The people that you hang around, the people that you hang around are the people that you become. Oh, yeah. Uh, like you say, the naysayers and always looking for validation outside of yourself. You yes. need this person's opinion. You need this person to co-sign on this. Uh, if this person doesn't think a certain kind of way, then you second guess yourself. So it's a lot of soul searching that you encourage your clients to do as well. Yeah, it's huge. The people that you hang out with is massive because here's the thing as well. Obviously, you, you, you want to have role models that you can follow, but they've got to be the right, first of all, they've got to be the right role model. So there are some amazing role models in business. You know, people like Tony Robbins, Gary Vaynerchuk, um, Grant Cardone, you can't knock them for what they do and then following. They're not for me. I can't resonate with that macho hustle, hustle, grind style at all. So I found role models, perhaps that people have never heard of, but they're successful uh, and I can follow them. That to me is the right thing, but also your friends who you hang out with. There's a lot of people who don't get me. <laughs> And when I, when I went up Kilimanjaro, they thought I was off my head. And then when I said I wasn't doing it again, they were like, you know, and I'm like, I don't need that kind of negativity. And, and they I... didn't want to share in my talking about it. And it's important that you, you find friends who get you because otherwise you're going to start doubting yourself and you start conforming to fit in, don't conform to fit in with anybody. Cha it, it's not about changing yourself to fit in with other people. It's about finding your tribe. And once you find your tribe who do get you, all of a sudden you're flying. You feel, you know, a completely different person. Um, and sometimes like one of my clients, she was brought up, I'm not going to say which one, but she was brought up um, with a particular religion. She found it didn't resonate with her at all. It, she started to doubt herself. She, she, she was full of anxiety. When she decided that I can't do this, it's just not for me, and she started looking, she was um, basically disowned by her family. And that's hard and that takes courage. But now that she's found 
the right path for her, she's blossoming. She's found her new family. They may not be blood, but she's found her new family. She's found and her new family. Is, she's flying. In the world of social media, people are looking for likes and collecting people like tokens. Your tribe does not have to be 5,000. No. A core of five that resonate with your message, that meet you where you are, that you value their opinion, that you respect them, that you can have uh, conversations whether you agree or disagree. You don't have to be disagreeable. They challenge exactly. you. They support you. They encourage you. They fund you. All these things are what friends are supposed to be. Wouldn't you agree? <clears throat> Absolutely. And it's about them respecting you. And I have friends, you know, we haven't got to be the same and agree on everything. I have friends <clears throat> who have very different beliefs, but we respect each other's differences. And that is um, another thing to look for when you're looking for your tribe. So um, these friends, we have a lot of things in common. Uh, like a love of a love of travel, a love of um, you know, uh, like digital working and that kind of thing. But we have very different beliefs um, about other things, <laughs> and that's fine. We just agree to disagree and respect each other's choices, and and that respect is everything. If somebody doesn't respect you for being different, they're not part of your tribe. Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad that you are here and you are part of our tribe, Tina. You are so adventurous. I'm so glad that you reinvented yourself, that you found out who you are, you find value in that, and you're pouring that into others. Please tell my brains how to get in contact with you. Maybe they want to go on one of these amazing adventures, come to Spain, or coach with you. How do we get in contact with you, Tina? Well, it's nice and easy because my website is myname.com. So tinasibley.com. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, Tina Sibley. And there's usually me a picture of me on one of my latest adventures right now. It's Kilimanjaro. <laughs> like he's in the background here. And, how many, how uh, many times have you been to Kilimanjaro? I've been twice. The first time I was sick. I got It's an eight-day expedition. And I became sick on the evening of uh, day one. Passed out. Wow. Uh, and I had a, a tummy bug. I kind of had one, gone swimming, foolishly, went swimming in a lake the day before, picked up a sickness and diarrhea bug. Mm, mm. Uh, so I was quite sick. I don't know how I made it to the summit, but I, with the help of the amazing guides, I did. Uh, but I knew after I came back that, you know what, if I hadn't been sick, I would enjoy it so much more. And I was right. And I did. But it's it's tough. And here's another lesson that I'm going to that I would love to share from Kilimanjaro. A, a big achievement like that. Is impossible to do on your own. I could never have done that on my own. I did it with the help of my personal trainer who got me fit beforehand. But the guides, the, the guides were phenomenal. The porters who carried the stuff, you know, uh, and, and the, the, the chefs and the waiters who, who feed you, you know, it's, there's a huge team. Without that team, you, you know, not a single one of us would have made it to the summit. And, and also it's about another big lesson that I learned was, over the years, coaching is very much rah, rah, I can look after myself, empowerment, female empowerment, especially. I don't need anyone else. I'm self-sufficient. But I learned about accepting help. Accepting oh. help is huge, you know, and it's about getting the right guides and following their advice. And allowing them to lead you when they've done it a million times before. Silly little things like the first time after I was sick, I was carrying my backpack. I can do this. And our lead guide, a guy called James, I love him to bits. He's like my brother. Um, he came over 
and basically started unbuckling my backpack and said, I want that. And I'm like, no, I can carry my own backpack. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. And I probably could have, but I would have run out of energy at some point. And I learned to graciously accept that help. Right. And even ask for it when I needed to. And that was a massive lesson. Uh, and to listen to them, you know, and they were saying, yeah, you can carry it, but you'll run out of steam. Right. And, you know, again, you can't pour from an empty coffer. You need to continuously replenish, renew, and recognize, reward, and ask for help. We yes. are here to help one another. We are our brother and sister's keeper. Thank you so much for being here on the edge with me. Tina, you are the Thank best. You. Now, okay, I don't know. Like I said, I don't want to doubt myself. I don't know if I have that much courage. Uh, I got a kink in my hip, so I don't know if I can get to the top of the summit. But what I do uh, feel that I have climbed to a new heights with your enthusiasm, with your drive. So I want myself and others to live vicariously through your joy. Thank you so much for being here on The Edge. You are the best. Thank you, April. An absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye, brains.